Right, hi. Uh, thank you very much for coming to my talk. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing myself. So I'm Mark. I'm the Studio Technical Director at Lucid Games. Lucid Games is a UK-based games developer based in Liverpool. And um, we've been developing games in Unreal for over 10 years, which is pretty much the whole lifetime of the company. Um, we develop our own games. But we've also done a lot of co-dev with other studios, and we've helped them out on various degrees, working on their own Unreal games. And that's kind of quite relevant to what I'm going to talk about today, because um, what I'm going to talk about is kind of one of my favorite subjects, and it's something I don't think people talk about enough. Um, and it's asset dependency chains. Um, has kind of various other terms that people give it, dependency hell. And um, you know, I've heard people say it's, it's kind of the biggest problem that kind of AAA developers have to deal with during the lifetime of a project. And it's also one of the most common pro problems that people have to deal with, at least in my experience anyway. And this kind of talk is mainly for technical people, so programmers, tools programmers, and um, people that work with blueprints. So I'm going to kind of talk about what asset dependency chains are initially. And so basically what it is, is um, every time an asset hard references another asset in your asset database, it creates a dependency. Now, it, not only does it have a dependency on that asset, but it has a dependency on that asset's hard references or its dependencies as well. So what you end up is slowly during the course of development, if you're not careful, you can end up with a massive chain appearing, like in my, my diagram there, because the references join together and you end up with a big chain. Now, the reason why this is a problem is because absolutely the core of Unreal, whenever you load an asset, it kind of has to load all its dependencies as well. And um, these dependencies chains can spread very easily. And you can end up with huge amounts of loading going on and not realize it immediately. Because it's not particularly obvious that it's happening until it gets to a point where it actually becomes really unmanageable and really difficult. And um, you know, I've had to deal with a lot of these problems during the, the course of my career and working in Unreal. And uh, I, I'll probably say that pretty much every gray hair on my head has been caused by a hard reference in an asset somewhere. So I'm going to kind of go through the problems that depend large dependency chains cause, because they kind of have lots of different symptoms that you will see kind of appearing in your projects. I kind of think the most obvious one is editor startup time. And you know, often when I get asked to look at a project and to look at help improve the editor startup time, the first thing I look for are like asset dependency chains. And that's nearly always kind of one of the first symptoms people notice. But you kind of tend to get other performance issues in the editor as well, because you know, whenever you load an asset, it has to load the dependencies. So loading assets can take a long time, and you suddenly find that something that loaded very quickly would suddenly take much longer to load. Um, there's also various UI operations in the editor as well. Like when you right click on an asset, sometimes it has to load the asset. And then again, the dependency chain can cause a big pause in the, the editor. Um, cook times as well can be affected because when it cooks an asset, it has to load it. And then it has, so therefore it has to load all its dependencies. So you end up with your cooker taking a lot of time and also a lot of memory because it's constantly loading everything in when it cooks it. And um, you know, if you don't have enough memory on your machine, it's going to thrash your garbage. The, you know, the garbage um, collector is going to get thrashed and stuff's going to get loaded and unloaded very rapidly in memory, causing you know, a lot of churn and a lot of slowdown. So um, you know, that's another symptom of this. Um, your game boot up time can be affected as well because if when your game boots up, if some of the first things it loads have a lot of dependencies, then you end up loading kind of most of your game on boot up. I've seen that on you know, some of the games that we've worked on internally. That was one of the first problems that we encountered. And um, there's also things like game packaging as well can be difficult because you end up with large dependency chains and you can't break your game down into chunks because as far as the database is concerned, everything is connected, everything is required. Um, and it's not just your tool chain and your workflow that gets affected by this. You know, there's runtime as well. And often a symptom of this is running out of memory because 
you know, your game can't unload things because it genuinely thinks everything should be loaded in. So you run out of the limited memory you have. And another effect of it as well is that if you've got loads of objects loaded in because of your dependency chains, then the garbage collector is going to be visiting all these objects as part of its kind of runtime routine. So there are also some specific things as well that you should be aware of. Like um, one thing I noticed um, in Unreal is that the Persona module will actually load all the Anim Notify blueprints on when the editor starts up. Now, I'm not sure if it still does this on 5, to be honest with you, because I know that the Persona modules had a bit of a rework. But this is something we saw a lot on 4, that you know, when the editor started up, if it loaded an Anim Notify blueprint that had a big dependency chain, and suddenly you get this massive you know, passive pause in the editor starting up. Um, another thing as well to be aware of is that blueprint function libraries, they're always loaded because, you know, you need to, when you're making blueprints and you maybe want to call a function in the function library, the editor needs to know what functions are available. So if your blueprint function libraries have large dependency chains, then that's also going to increase the amount of stuff the editor needs to load. And um, this is another one that has been mentioned to me at the bottom here, is that, if you load assets directly in your C++ constructors for your U objects, then the class default object, when that gets created, when the editor starts, will load all your assets. So you could get a massive asset chain getting loaded right at the very start of the engine. So that's something to be really careful about because that can cause other problems as well, not just slowness and memory consumption. So currently in the editor, you've kind of got two ways that I typically use to find out if you've got large dependency chains. I mean, the most common one is size map, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that. And that's something that if you right click on an asset in the editor, you can, you can effectively see the dependency chain, or at least how large it is. And then you can also use the reference viewer to kind of view what assets a particular asset references, and also what assets reference that asset. So, I'm going to call, talk now about what kind of causes hard references. So some of them are really obvious, like explicitly referencing an asset, like in a, in a property field or in a data table or in a data asset. Um, you know, that's obviously you're saying, I want to reference this asset, so the asset has to be there. So that kind of makes sense, and, you know, it, they're quite visible. You can see them by looking at your, your fields. Um, some things can be a little bit more subtle is like if you have an asset and you use it as a type, let's say you make a blueprint, a player blueprint that has all the player's assets in it, um, and then you actually pass that to functions or use it in you know, various um, blueprint scripts or store it and things like that, then you, know, you end up keeping a hard reference to that asset. And if that asset's got lo loads of you know, assets that it references, then you you're ending up with a very heavy data type in terms of memory. Um, and then, the, yeah, the types can be used in various, various fields. But I think um, one of the big ones that I've seen and one of the biggest problems we have is the blueprint cast. So I think a lot of people tend to be unaware of this when they're, they're developing their, their projects, is that whenever you do a cast to a type, you kind of create a hard dependency on that type. And um, so, what I want to talk about is workflow methods to kind of prevent these problems from happening. And you kind of need to keep a handle on all your hard references. Otherwise, they'll just get out of hand. So one of the things you can do is regularly do a size map on the blueprints that you're working on, just to make sure you haven't accidentally pulled in a reference chain. Um, get a good understanding of how your blueprints use assets, how they reference them. Um, and kind of avoiding referencing assets that, you know, you don't necessarily need to use right now. Um, you know, you might want to load them, for example. And, um, you know, if it's a hard reference, it will just make it get loaded automatically. But if you were, like, I don't know, if you had a spawner that had a list of things that could potentially be spawned, you don't want to use hard references because then your spawner will load every single asset. You want to have a soft reference and then a system for loading it. And you can use the Asset Manager to kind of help you with this. Now, I could go into detail about the Asset Manager, but I think that's a whole other talk. And there's some kind of good 
reference material online about that, but I definitely think if you're thinking about tackling problems or trying to avoid problems with asset dependencies, then I would say definitely look at using the asset manager. Um, another thing you can do, of course, is you can make some tools as well, because you know just doing a size map in the editor GUI on every asset is you know it's going to take you forever and it's going to be very time consuming and not much fun. So you could write a commandlet that would that does the same thing, that kind of iterates through all your assets or maybe just all your blueprints and generates a size map using um, you know the the editor API. And then you could do things like have thresholds as to like blueprint interfaces. You might want to have a low threshold. Um, same with blueprint function libraries, but you might want to have a higher threshold for actual blueprints. Another thing you can use is the editor validation system, which is really good. Um, you can kind of create classes there that will actually process on different asset types. So you can actually check um, dependency sizes and dodgy casts and things like that actually in a validator. So that can kind of become part of your workflow that you're constantly validating assets to make sure they don't do anything that's going to cause you problems with asset dependency chains. So I guess one of the important things is trying to avoid hard references and blueprints. And I think at the most fundamental level, it's trying to not to mix logic and assets together in the same blueprint. And that tends to be the cause of most of the problems that I've seen, whereas you'll get an asset that kind of, pull, like you'll get a blueprint that pulls in things like skeletal animations and, and models and all kinds of stuff, but then it'll also have logic in it that external systems might want to use, and then they end up casting to it, and it ends up pulling everything that it uses. So. It's good to try and separate your logic. You could put your logic in native classes. You could put your logic in blueprint classes and then inherit from those blueprint classes to create your kind of asset-based blueprint classes. Um, <clears throat> and again, casts, be very careful about them. Um, one thing that we have seen as well is even when you go and fix casts, sometimes there can be residual references from the output of the cast. Um, I think it's been fixed now, but in the past I've seen, you know, the reroute nodes can retain hard references even when the thing that was originally feeding them with data has been removed. So sometimes, also sometimes nodes that took the result of a cast would hold on to a hard reference even if you kind of changed the, the cast to doing something else. So that's something to be really careful about. Um, and it can still happen. So for things like loading assets, um, soft references, they're really good because they don't have a, a reference to the, to the asset itself, a hard reference to the asset. So you can use the asset manager to load them in or you can load them in using your own blueprint logic. Um, and then a good way to kind of separate um, the dependencies in your um, asset database. So there's kind of two other things as well that work really well, having a native parent class, so not just inheriting the blueprint from an, an engine class and putting all your stuff in there, but actually having a, a parent class um, that you inherit from that's part of your project. You can kind of retrospectively reparent as well. So if you've made a mistake and you've you know, made a blueprint that's inherited from actor and you want to actually put some of your functionality in there in the, into a native class, then you can create a native class inherit, that inherits from actor and then reparent your blueprint and um, then you can actually put logic in that new native class and you can cast to that instead. And the cast into a, like a native class really has no memory cost and the, because the dependency is just a, in the code module which is already loaded anyway. Um, same with blueprint interfaces as well. If you, you may well be doing a lot of blueprint logic and you might think, well, I need to still keep my, my functions in blueprint. So you can have a blueprint interface instead and that kind of gives you a level of abstraction that avoids a hard reference. Um, one thing you have to be really careful about is that your blueprint interfaces themselves don't have dependency chains. I have seen this where people with the best intentions have used blueprint interfaces, but the types in the function parameters of the blueprint interfaces have been blueprint types, and those blueprint types have had you know, large dependencies. So 
You still have to be careful even when you're using Blueprint interfaces. So I'm going to kind of cover casting a little bit here because, as I said before, it's kind of like a um, really common cause. Now, one thing I see a lot is people doing a Blueprint cast just to check a type. So if you can kind of see this one here, you can see the result of the cast isn't actually used. All it does is say, oh, check if the cast is successful and then run some logic on that. And so you could have, for example, a box trigger that it checks what actor's gone in and if it's a certain type of actor, it might do something. Now, if you use a cast to check the actor type, you can pull in a hard reference to that, to that actor. Um, there are ways around this. Um, one of the things I've seen is using a base class and having some type detection in that base class. Like you could have an enum just saying what, what thing it is, what type it is. Um, but something I think is more useful is actually using gameplay tags. So if you have a gameplay tag container in your native base class, you could have a tag for every type of actor that you have. So instead of using the cast to check for the actor type, you can use a gameplay tag instead. Um, another thing that this allows you to do is you could do other checks. You could have some kind of abstract internal state that can be represented in tags. So rather than actually having to go into the actor itself and find its state, you could actually check for tags. And it will also separate the state from the actual implementation of the actor as well, which kind of can have other uses and be handy as well. Um, and at the bottom, there's a kind of a trick that was showed to me by someone from Epic. Um, where what you can do is write a blueprint function that checks, an act, checks if an actor is of a class. But instead of passing in the actual um, type, you can put a, use a soft class reference instead. And then you can do a comparison check. You can resolve or try and resolve the soft class reference. And then you can do a comparison check and then return the result. And this won't have a hard dependency because if the soft class reference reference is something that's not loaded, then that will be null. So that check will be null. And if it's not there, if it's not loaded, then whatever you're checking against, it can't be the thing. So, and if it does resolve successfully, you can actually check the type there. So this is a kind of a way of doing a, a, a type check without having to have a hard reference. And you could put this in a blueprint function library or something like that um, and use it. And it's also quite easy to substitute the old cast method for this as well. So I'm going to kind of go into the kind of the main area now um, of my talk. Because the thing is, it, it's all well and good, somebody coming up to you and saying, oh, yeah, you should have written your project completely differently. Um, sorry about that. Um, and it's, you know, it is frustrating when you're getting close to shipping a game and you've got a problem. And, and the answer is, oh, you've done it all wrong. So really what I'm going to cover is if you are in a situation, if you're close to shipping, you're having all these problems. Um, and this is something we've had to deal with many times at Lucid. Then I'm going to kind of talk about how we went about it. And we went through various stages of developing tools to help us with this. And um, I'm going to kind of talk through the, the process that we kind of went through. So bef before I do that, I'm going to talk about two really, really useful things that if you're not familiar with them, I would suggest you kind of read up on them and, and because they have so many tasks and so many applications you can use them for that we found them incredibly useful. And the first one is commandlets, which it just allows you to run a command line tool um, from the editor. And it kind of gives you access to all the editor's facilities. And it is one of the easiest things to do in Unreal in terms of code, because all you have to do is inherit from this the commandlet class and then write a main function, essentially and you're good to go. And we've used this for loads and loads of tools. And you've got access to all the editor facilities. You know, it's not just limited to what you have at runtime. You can, you can do anything the editor can do. And the other thing is the asset registry. And I love the asset registry. I use it all the time. And it gives loads of information about assets without having to load them. And that's the key thing. Because if you're trying to solve a problem where you've got massive asset dependencies, and you have to load them in to get information on them to help you fix them, then your process is going to take a huge amount of time. Whereas this, it will use the metadata that's generated by the editor. And there's a lot of information you can get from this. You can get the disk space. You can get all the reference information about what hard references they have and you know, what objects hard reference them. 
and you can create a lot of tools for categorizing and cataloging your assets and their, their respective sizes. And you can also add your own data as well. You can add new properties um, that will get saved to the asset registry and you can also just write something that will fill in the tag container that the asset registry has for each asset. Right, so I'm going to talk now about the first stage that we went through when we were trying to solve problems with projects with large dependencies. So the first thing we did was we kind of created a commandlet to generate a report on the overall status of the project. Because I think I mentioned this earlier in the kind of prevention section that you, know, you need to have something that will give you the scope of the problem in the project. It, it's, it's easy to do a size map on random assets, but what you really need to do is you need to do a size map on every asset. So you can do this with the asset registry. You can write a commandlet that iterates through every asset and for each asset, recursively go through its dependencies and sum the sizes. You will have to write logic to stop um, circular references, but that's fairly straightforward. Um, and then what you can do then is you can generate a list of every asset and its, and its size, uh, its dependency chain size. Then you can do a sorted list, and then at the top of the list, you have your worst assets. And then you've got at least a list of things to tackle. Um, you can kind of take it a step further and wait, wait the, um, the sorting by like how many incoming references something has. That's something we found worked quite well because then you've got something like this has got the worst dependency chain, but it's also referenced the most, so it's probably a good one to have a look at. So once we had our list, we had to try and find where the references were in the, in the blueprints that had lots of external references and um, we can kind of use the reference manager to actually show you which assets there were but um, in order to actually find where the references were it wasn't always that straightforward. Uh, one of the things we did find was quite useful is if we couldn't find a reference in a blueprint we would actually copy and paste to actually select the nodes and paste them into notepad and as you can see here you've actually got as text the asset reference. I mean, this is a very obvious example, and you can see that this would be an external reference. But we've had ones that have been more subtle, and um, you know, we've had to actually look at the text and um, yeah, find the references by actually copying and pasting from the graphs, which was very laborious, but it did give us the results we were looking for. But you know, after this first stage, we just found that having a list was really, really useful. It kind of opened up the extent of the problem for us. We could see you know, how many assets had dependency chains, how big the dependency chains got. But the thing that was really difficult was actually finding some of the references. So that's kind of took us to a next stage where um, we wanted to actually find a way of doing automatically doing what we did with copy and paste into Notepad. So we realized that we'd actually have to look inside the blueprints and um, look at the nodes and try and find where the package references were. So we kind of made a new blueprint, command, or a new commandlet, that what it did is it processed every blueprint. And initially, because we had so many problems with casts, we just searched for cast nodes and listed all the cast nodes and kind of worked out what their dependency chain size was by their external reference, and then kind of list all the ones over a certain threshold and give as much information as we could. And then that kind of helped us go through um, and find a lot of the, the, the dependencies and also just be able to give us a list, um, which was useful because we could you know, generate work items and things like that from it. So. This was definitely a step forwards for us because it kind of saved a lot of time finding references. I mean, didn't find everything because we were only looking for casts, but it kind of made us realize what we could do because we actually going into the blueprints, looking at the data through the editor API, actually looking at the nodes and the details of the nodes. And then we kind of thought, well, let's take this to the next step. So really, what the next step was, was we actually just tried to find everything. And it was a case of going into the blueprint, going through every node, every property, 
trying to find where all the external references were and um, being able to give a full report. And we kind of had these two reports that we generated. Um, the first one was called, what is this asset referencing and how? So we already knew what it was referencing. We could get that from the asset registry. But what we wanted to do is detail every single reference, say what property it was, what blueprint graph it was in, what node it was, what type of node, and just give full information so that every single problematic reference in the project, we had enough details to be able to find it and fix it. And, um, and we had another query, which was sort of the reverse of that, of detailing how a particular asset was referenced, because we might have something that's getting pulled in too much by too many things. So we wanted to investigate how it was getting referenced. Were there any common patterns that we, we could change or anything that we could implement that would actually help us um, avoid referencing it so much? And this is kind of a sample of the report. It was a text file. It was very verbose, and, but it kind of gave the information. Um, it is a bit technical because we just pulled strings and stuff out of the editor. But it kind of gave us enough information to kind of get an idea of um, where the references were. So you can see here, there's details in the fields. It will say, OK, there's this array here. This is an array, and it's got these references, these assets. And then we've actually got the dependency chain size there, so we can actually see how expensive the reference was. And then we've got something here to, in, the, in the actual blueprint graph. So we've kind of got the event graph. And we've got a cast there, and then we've got the actual cost of the reference there. And there's also in a pin as well, because the, it's the output pin of the cast node, essentially. And then we've got the opposite, where we're actually looking at how a particular asset is referenced. So we're saying it's, it's referenced by the game mode there, and it's also referenced by a spawn trigger bad, which was my bad example for the project. But it would kind of, um, we could see there that, yeah, that blueprint is a default pawn class. Um, and then with this, we've got a cast again. So this was kind of a good step forward because it gave us um, most of the information that we wanted. And it had a big list, big list of stuff that we needed to sort out or that needed to be sorted out on the projects. But one of the problems was, is I, I'm sure you can imagine by looking at that list I showed you before that it was, you know, it was it was difficult to go from the report to the editor. You'd have the path of the asset, you'd have the node name, and but then you'd have to load the asset into Unreal. You'd have to try and find the right graph and everything, and it just took a little bit, a little bit of time to go from that text file to to where the, the problem was. And when you're dealing with a project that has a lot of asset dependency problems, you know, it can get very laborious. So. What we decided to do next was to try and put a, a UI on top of it um, because I found I was going backwards and forwards all the time. So what, what I decided to do, I'm a, I'm a big fan of DRIM GUI, so I tried to get DRIM GUI running in an editor window. And because I didn't exactly know how the, the UI would look, I kind of wanted to have something I could iterate with really, really fast. So I ended up just trying loads of ideas out in IM GUI and that communicated with the code we'd already written because we had we had the reports in memory, and so I could access them in the UI and, and show them in the UI. Um, and the idea being that we could look through the report in this UI and actually get it to kind of use the editor facilities to kind of load the blueprints, highlight assets, highlight nodes, um, and kind of do that connection between the report and the actual um, asset database in the editor itself. So this is kind of like, and I apologize for the kind of, um, <laughs> it's not very legible, I know. But the important thing is that this, this here is the, the list of assets, and this is the detail of the assets. And then we've kind of got how the individual assets are referenced here. So this is pretty much the same data as I was showing you before. But um, as I can kind of show you in the next one, um, if this is playing now. So this is just a video of me running it. So the first thing I do is I make it generate the list. Then I can kind of pick an item in the list. Um, I can look at the hard references. And then I can also get to generate the details. 
So now we've kind of got that information that I showed you in the text file. We've kind of got the two properties there, and then we've got the cast node there, and then we can kind of click on the buttons, and it will bring the asset in the up in the content browser. And um, you can also, for the blueprint node, click on the node in the report, and it'll actually bring, so you see the cast node there. So what that allows you to do is look at the report, and you should be able to click in the UI, and it to bring up the part of the asset that is causing the problem, and allow you to kind of address it directly in the editor. And we find that having that workflow made it a lot faster to kind of fix the problems. So, yeah, it, it kind of worked much better um, than before. And, um, but one of the problems we had was, because we're using DRIM GUI, there was incompatibilities. Um, with some, because some people, like, in their projects, they kind of had their own implementation of DRIM GUI, and I had to hack it a fair bit to get it working in this. So it, it was great for development, but it didn't kind of, it, it's not like the perfect solution for the UI. So I think one of my many things I want to do in the future is actually do a proper Slate UI for it. Now I've got a better idea about how it should look. So the next thing we decided to have a look at is trying to um, come up with different ways of visualizing the data and different queries. Because we kind of found that with a lot of asset dependency issues, there were kind of there were, there were different aspects to them. There were different ways that things were getting referenced. And we were constantly just looking at things from a kind of um, a big list of assets and a big list of dependencies. But we thought we'd try and different ways of visualizing it. So one of the things we did um, was actually trying to create a visual output. And we wrote some code. I don't know if you've used GraphViz, but it's a kind of an open source package that you can give it a description file, and it'll generate a, a visual graph for you. So um, we wrote something that generated graphs. And so this is a kind of a more visual. So that's our asset there. And then we've got its dependencies. But what we also did is we color coded um, the nodes on the graph. I apologize again for the legibility of this. It was quite difficult to get something that was readable. But the important thing is, is the actual the shape of the graph and the coloring. So the coloring is like the dependency chain size. So we had thresholds that caused the coloring. And we could kind of have a look at the, the problematic reference paths. Um, but then looking at a larger scale, you could sort of visually see problem areas. Like, see here, we can see that that node there pulls in all this stuff. So this is kind of like a leaf trace. So for a, for a given asset, we'll just say trace all your dependencies until you hit like a leaf asset, which is an asset that doesn't have any dependencies, typically something like a texture. And you can see here, it's sort of tracing outwards until it hits the leaves. But then you can see there's this path here that goes down there and then pulls in all this stuff. So having this visual representation means that we can immediately look at this problem and go, well, that's a, prob that's a big problem there. Let's have a look at this connection here between these two nodes and see if we can find out why it's happening and if we can do anything to fix it. And um, we also found that these graphs worked a lot better with um, you know, technical designers, people who were kind of um, could had a better sort of understanding of the of sort of a, a visual representation rather than a very technical, verbose um, representation, which is what we had before. And then we did a kind of another trace, where we kind of um, trace backwards. Now this is something I'm still messing around with and trying to get right, but it would it would be the opposite of the leaf trace. It would kind of be tracing back for a particular asset everything that references it. So they kind of vary a fair bit. Like this one is a, this like spawner, for example, gets referenced by two maps. So that's very simple. But then we've got a kind of a more complex blueprint that ends up having just everything, essentially. I mean, if I if I showed you the full graph, it would just be like everything in the in the entire game, kind of referencing it. So it kind of, uh, yeah, they can vary. And we have been trying to experiment with ways of actually limiting at how far back it goes in its trace. Um, but it's still something that we've been tweaking with. And um, yeah, we haven't got any kind of conclusive um, 
ways of displaying that data. Um, so, similar to what I talked about before, is you know, there's nothing worse than when you're trying to ship a game and you've got to the point where you're really running out of time, and then somebody says you need to fix all your asset dependency issues, and you're kind of like, well, I just don't have time to do that. You know, it's not it's not practical. So you need to try and come up with some kind of solution that gets you over the finish line. It may not be might not get you over the finish line kind of elegantly, but it will allow you to ship your game. And um, I think one thing that we found is that typically there's always this big blob of assets, usually around the player, that's kind of always gets loaded and always gets used. So really what we kind of thought of doing was actually having a look at this blob, see if we can say, okay, well, we're not going to get rid of this. But since it's used everywhere, it's not the worst thing in the world that it's always in memory and it always gets loaded. Let's concentrate on the things outside it, things that, don't, that aren't always used that will get referenced by this blob. So say, for example, you might have some player logic that checks whether or not the players hit a certain AI type and that does a cast. But that particular AI type only exists on levels two and five. But because of the hard reference, it will get loaded for every single level. So it's trying to find those and eliminate those, not trying to eliminate stuff that's already used, like all the players' um, animations and various other bits and bobs that are kind of different assets, but ultimately all depend on each other. So it's, it's a kind of case of trying to identify these. And, and we did have various traces, like we would look at the runtime and see what, what objects were loaded, and if we saw something that looked like it shouldn't be there, then we could do things like do one of our asset traces. We had one that allowed us to trace from one particular asset to another particular asset. So if we had something that didn't belong there, we would try and trace from the player pawn um, blueprint to these, these assets that shouldn't be there. And um, we would then find out through the trace exactly what was putting them in, and often it was, you know, things that we wouldn't expect and sometimes it was multiple things so we'd fix one and then we'd run the test again and then it would be something else but you know eventually we would get it um, one thing we did actually work quite well was actually allow us to configure our asset traces to kind of pretend that a dependency had been fixed so then we could kind of run it again and see if there was still a dependency so we could kind of almost do a dry run through of fixing things and then seeing if that fix would actually be effective or whether we'd have to fix other things afterwards. So one thing that's kind of been in common with all the projects that I've worked on is they've all been brilliant projects written by brilliant people. And, um, you know, you do sort of have to ask the question of, you know, in terms of technical debt, there are some, there's, there's some technical debt that's worth it and there's some that isn't. And I think it's not always bad if it gets you where, where you want to go. It, um, you know, because it may be that you have to put a prototype together really quickly to get a publisher to sign your game or whatever. And, you know, if, if it's something like that, a situation like that, you need, you know, you don't really want to be, like, burdened by having to you know, make sure that your project is technically perfect. Um, and you don't want to be too restrictive on your designers because you may want them to try lots of ideas out and rapidly iterate. So there is a certain amount of judgment that needs to be done in order to, um, you know, to fix the problems, but also carry on developing your game, making a really good game. Um, you know, and I guess only you know your projects. You need to make the judgment calls. But I think the important thing is to understand the scope of the problem because, you know, debt isn't always a bad thing if you know how you're going to pay it back and you know the extent of it as well. So it's really a question of getting visibility on the problem um, and then knowing how you're going to fix it. And maybe, you know, let's say you, you're, you're doing a prototype and, and your game gets signed. You can say, yeah, we've been signed now. We've got time let's sort the stuff out now, rather than trying to keep everything in check when you're actually trying to hit a difficult milestone. You know, you're trying to, um, you know, 
get some ideas out into the game and, and test them out. If you want to do rapid iteration, you know, you don't want to be restricted by practices to avoid technical issues. So, you know, I would say that you have to be careful. There are definitely things you can do that you should always do. And I think having a good alternative to a cast is good. And I think if you did something like use gameplay tags instead, then, um, you know, that might also give things like your designers a bit more creative freedom. So you might be able to, by fixing some of these problems, you might be able to empower your designers. But it's always important to bear in mind that if you put too many rules in place, you may well restrict what they can do. So be careful. And that's my talk. <laughs>